evening, wherever you are. Thank you all for joining us today for our sound design, Finding Your Sound with Tom Holkenborg, also known as Junkie XL. Tom, thank you so much for being here today and thank you for doing this with us. I'm super happy, super happy to be here with you guys. Um, super passionate about sound design, so I can tell you, I can talk for days about sound design. Great, so. well, we are into it. We'll take all of the knowledge, all of the wisdom. Um, remind our attendees who are jumping on of some of your credits, please. Well, I started as an electronic musician under the name Junkie XL, and in that respect, I released um, seven, eight studio albums, and I worked with people like um, Coldplay, Chuck D, Dave Cahan, Depeche Mode, Britney Spears, Madonna, to name a few. Uh, and eventually, I made the switch into film scoring. I collaborated with Hans Zimmer on multiple movies in the period 2010, 11, 12. And from 2013 on, I started scoring my own movies, um, uh, including uh, 300 Rise of an Empire, uh, Batman vs. Superman, uh, Deadpool, uh, Mad Max, uh, Alita Battle Angel, and uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, Sonic the Hedgehog and Scooby-Doo. So just a couple films then, one or two. I'm sorry? Just a couple of films then, just one or two. <laughs> okay. um, before we get started, before we jump into questions, just wanted to go through a couple housekeeping items. First and foremost, I just want to say thank you to our PMA Academy session sponsors, the National Music Publishers Association and APM Music. Their contributions are greatly appreciated um, and allow for us to continue to offer these webinars free of charge for the remainder of 2020. So big thank you to them. Um, also, if you are not yet a PMA member, I highly encourage you to become one. Uh, composers can join for $99 a year, and we also have various library membership options for um, publisher members. Um, dues for membership also help us put on these sessions along with our other advocacy, educational, and community efforts over the years. And, you know, it's really such a big community and one that, in my opinion, is oftentimes undervalued. So, you know, I, I really encourage you to join, be a part of the community and use your voice to help us uh, ensure a better future for our community. So if you're interested in learning more joining, um, you can learn more at pmamusic.com or you can always email me at morgan at pmamusic.com anytime. Um, last but not least, uh, some exciting news. All attendees today are going to be emailed a unique discount code for 20% off the Orchestral Tools Complete Library. So big thank you to them and a reminder to all of you to keep an eye on your email inbox. You can find info on that library at jxlbrass.com. All right. Are you ready to jump in, Tom? All right. Um, and a reminder, any audience members that have questions, please utilize the chat, say hello, please interact with each other. We are monitoring questions there as well. But we will get started with what characteristics separate different kinds of sounds and how can they be used in hybrid orchestration? Um, well, that, <clears throat> I would say it's such a broad question because uh, uh, almost every aspect uh, of sound in a film score or music in general can be subject to sound design. And that's exactly what I do. Um, so I create layers of sound design between the various different elements that need to be glued together. So let me give you um, an example. Uh, if I have a drum rhythm and I have a bass line that goes with the drum rhythm, um, I usually create sound design elements of the drums and I create sound design elements of the bass sounds and they now start to create glue between those two layers. And I do the same with uh, the uh, orchestral elements, not all the time. For instance, Sonic the Hedgehog is a more traditional straight up uh, orchestral score and there's usually a little less sound design going on in, in that world, but most of my film scores have these layers of sound design that connect different instrument groups together. Uh, that way, another thing that is a benefit of that is that uh, 
music doesn't sound per se as some electronic track with a full orchestra slapped on top of it. It, 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 it creates layers uh, of sounds in between. So the transition from uh, electronic sounds into the organic orchestral sounds is done step by step. <clears throat> I use various different tools for that to do that. And um, there's a, a software program um, which is relatively cheap. Uh, is uh, and it's called Metasit, and it's it's made by some French people. Uh, I forgot what the company is called, but you, you can you can Google it. Another company that makes very interesting uh, plugins uh, is from Earcam, uh, which is also French. What is up with the French? You know, they always come up with the coolest stuff. Uh, and uh, so um, so those software programs allow me to do certain things. And I'm, I am going to get um, uh, a little technical here, uh, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, and that is that um, sound can be defined in amplitude. And it can be defined in what frequencies are playing at a certain point in time. And together, uh, that is called an FFT analysis. Uh, it, it's almost like. A 3D graph of like amplitude of sound and how many frequencies are part of that sound. Now you can take a picture of that and you can store that picture and you can basically apply the information of that picture onto a completely different destination audio file. And that's exactly what you can do in medicine. So uh, an example, and I've done this actually uh, in real life. Uh, when I did 300 Rise of an Empire, which is a sword and sandals movie done by Zack Snyder, um, there's a lot of sea battles in that movie. And so there was a rhythm of the water hitting against the boats when they would be rowing. And uh, so there was a lot of conversation back and forth between the sound design department who actually takes care of the sound design in the film itself. So not the music sound design, but the sound design in the film. And I said, can you give me bounces of uh, all that water hitting against the boat coming from the film? And so I got this. And so the, the sound of the wave would be and then another one and another one. And so I tried to time what the tempo was of that wave. And I found the tempo. It was something like 77 and a half uh, beats per minute. And so I started creating drum rhythms in that, in that rhythm, uh, on that tempo. And then I took uh, two audio files into medicine. One was actually the sound of the wave as I received it from the sound department. And the other audio file was the drums that I had programmed. And I basically took an image filter picture of the waves. So we see the amplitude of the sounds, but we also have all the frequency, uh, frequency information of the wave. The beautiful thing of a wave is that it's close to white noise, which means that all frequencies of the frequency spectrum are very well represented uh, in that sound. People that have been uh, at the beach uh, to see those heavy waves uh, crush onto the beach will know that the amount of low frequencies and the amount of high frequencies is absolutely insane if, if a big wave is crashing on the rocks or on the beach. Um, so I took a, f a picture of that, a filter picture, and then I applied it onto my drums uh, audio file as destination. And now I, I hear drum rhythms, but it has the sound of the crashing wave. And it's a very, very interesting way to create rhythm. And I use that um, as my source of rhythm uh, for these action sequences. And obviously, they would line up perfectly in sync with what actually the waves were doing, because it was that exact tempo. So this is an ex example um, how to use that creatively. And it became an interesting sound within, within the music. And then I did the same thing with strings onto basses. Uh, I did the same thing with brass uh, onto synthesizer pads. And you get these really interesting mix of colors. It sounds like brass, but it's not. It sounds like strings, but it's not. It sounds like drums, but it's not. And so the, all these interesting layers together 
uh, create something really unique. And um, I found that to be one of the most powerful tools that I use uh, in music every day. And it allows me to create a very distinctive uh, quality to the final production of my sound and uh, creating identity on all different levels is so important as a composer. It's not only the music that you write, but it's um, what type of instruments you use, how you use sound design, how do you mix your tracks, how do you record your tracks, and finally, how you master everything. Uh, so my identity is not just in the notes on paper. It's everything else that goes with it as well. Yeah. That's really <laughs> cool. So how do you, how can you mix so many sounds without masking? Um, well, um, mixing is tricky. And uh, uh, actually, a lot of people don't know that, but my career as a young kid, when I was 13, started... Uh, becoming an engineer at a local studio to record local bands. And um, so my first career in my teens, going up to my early 20s, was um, recording bands, producing them, and mixing them. And so uh, I had a very good old school upbringing in how mixing works and how frequencies work and how you need to split them and into something else. And then throughout my 20s, I started to understand that mixing is actually another instrument. You can do such crazy things with EQs to really personalize how you wanted things to sound. And um, it was in those years, I really started understanding how to create a really slamming sound, almost like a very over the top rock sound. And um, this was a little before uh, alternative rock became a thing, before uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit came out by Nirvana and uh, in, in 89, if I remember it correctly. And in those days, I was making um, industrial uh, music uh, in the same style as uh, later Nine Inch Nails and uh, Front 242, Nitzer App, Skinny Puppy. That was the scene I was in. And from there, I, it grew into my electronic music career as uh, Junkie XL. But even when my Junk XL records came out, there were so many different sounds in there, but it sounded more like a rock album than actually uh, an electronic dance album. Um, and that became a very distinctive sound of my productions. And then later in film, I did exactly the same thing. So Mad Max sounds more like a rock album than, than, a, than, a, than a film score, and to that extent, Deadpool too. Um, so um, very important part of my of, uh, of my sound is mixing it myself. And I do make a lot of mistakes, but you don't learn if you don't, don't make mistakes. So I love to work with a lot of different layers um, in music. And the idea is always that at, at a first listen, uh, you get the basic idea of what the piece of music needs to be. And it's supposed to grab you or in, on an emotional level or on a hyper uh, action level. But then if you listen to it again a few times, so that if you listen to it on a headset, you start discovering all these small little layers of sounds there that do have a function, but they're not necessarily that apparent uh, at the first listen. And that makes it for me so exciting. In producer's terms, they would use the word ear candy. So you have the track, it does what it does musically. And then you start working on all these little details that make it a little bit more interesting than if it's just a normal, uh, piece of music. So it's a very important part of, of, of my uh, career. I would say a good 20, 25 percent. Wow. Okay. Um, Ryan Weaver has a question. Hey, Tom, when you were sampling for sound design, what are the levels you were trying to achieve going into the DAW? And what tools do you use to check your levels? Um, well, I actually... Um, the way that I deal with leveling is um, primarily um, by just uh, looking at the meter. Um, so what's very important for one of the tricks that I learned when I was 13 and I started engineering um, is, um, is that you put your speakers at a certain level and you never, ever change it. Uh, so that way, you know, when something is loud and when something is quiet. If you keep turning your speakers up and then down and then up and then down, uh, you're never going to develop a reference what you're supposed to be listening to. 
you don't need a room that is fully tuned, acoustically perfect. I mean, look where I look, where I work here. You know, this is like the attic of 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 my uh, of my house. Uh, terrible acoustically. I don't care. You know, I I play a CD. Uh, well, CD sounds so old school. I play a bunch of MP3s uh, or audio files for two hours, three hours, and I'm just like, okay, there's a, a some comp filtering around 800 hertz. There is like a standing wave around 62. There's another one at 84. There's a dip um, 90 to 105. And, and so you, you notice everything that's not quite right. And instead of tuning that with EQs and processors, it only makes the speaker sound less. Uh, speakers are designed to sound in a certain natural state. I am personally not a big fan of all these speakers that have processors built in uh, to accommodate for all of that. I think speakers usually sound the best when they're set at neutral. And um, also in my engineering career, I had to listen to all these different speakers. Uh, in, in one studio, there were NS10s, other speakers, there were like three-way three GBLs. Then in the 80s, the Genelex came out um, uh, with the really nice top uh, high ends, which was not really the case in studio speakers before. Uh, and so the speakers changed always over time and you had to get used to what the speakers sound like. So back to your question, if you have your speakers always set at a basic level and you never change that until you become a very experienced uh, engineer and recordist, the speaker will tell you on that level Shit, this is this is a little loud. And then you look at the meter; it's like shit, plus two dB or plus three or, or whatever. Um, since I've been doing this for so long, uh, when I set up the mix for some of my tracks, I basically have something like CNN on, and I'm not even listening to what I'm doing. Uh, I just know what the cues need to be. I know what the level needs to be of this sound and that sound. And so I have, I have all these little. Uh, tricks uh, um, uh, in my head um, what it potentially needs to be. For instance, the loudest hit of your track, um, if that is minus five, uh, you still have a lot of room with a bunch of other instruments to, uh, to mix the rest uh, properly in there without you going over zero to B. Now, the thing is, I actually love to go over zero to B, but to a certain extent, I'm a really big fan of digital distortion, uh, but only to a certain amount, uh, not when it becomes totally like, and I've made mistakes with that as well. I've mastered some of my tracks so incredibly loud. And when I, when I listen to them back on a laptop and an iPhone, it's very exciting. But when you listen to it on really good speakers, it's a little on the harsh side. So, uh, like I said, I make constantly mistakes that I think it's a great idea. And then a half a year later, it's like, ah, that was not a good idea. Um, so um, metering is obviously important. I'm not discarding the importance of metering, um, but musical choices are, are, are more important, I think, than metering. And most of the DAWs right now have the 32-bit floating architecture. Um, which means that by pulling down a master fader, it will recalculate everything back in the chain and it will take the, the distortion out. And you are able to transfer distortion-free files <clears throat> to another setup. As long as you stay in the 32-bit floating world, the moment you start spitting files out in 32-bit straight or 24-bit straight, that's when uh, distortion will occur because now the floating aspect is gone. And most mastering software out there, uh, including Pro Tools and many, many other software programs will accept 32-bit floating files. And by basically just clip gaining the file down, this distortion will disappear. That's the beautiful thing of 32-bit float. So all my sessions are 32-bit float. My mastering sessions are 32-bit float. And only the final result that gets delivered to um, a CD printing company whoever buys CDs, but some do, uh, or vinyl, more hip. Uh, and obviously the digital format like MP3, that's when I start delivering actual WAV files uh, that are not floating. Uh, and that's the only step that you need to make sure. Now we need to be careful of, do we have distortion or not? Gotcha, okay, cool. 
Uh, I have a question from Tim Haas that says, how much actual music theory do you use in your approach to film music? Do you think rather from a sound design perspective or a, what we call a classical composer perspective or a combination of both? Well, what many people don't know is that uh, even though my, my, most of my scores in, in most of my music in the past, I've always called controlled noise, um, but I do have a very vast um, uh, theoretical background. Uh, I've studied music theory and I still study today for more than 30 years. Uh, and um, um, I always study uh, classical works. I have hundreds of orchestral scores uh, that I really pick apart. And then I listen to the to this symphony. And in, in this case, I'm, I'm studying two, um, two symphonies of Mahler. And again, I'm studying uh, to study Daphne and Chloe, which I've already studied 10, 15 times before. And you look at voicing, you look at the way that the melody develops according to um, uh, certain types of uh, orchestration and arranging rules that were developed over the last four or 500 years in, in music theory through history. And it's incredible powerful knowledge. And so um, when you're working on, on, a, on a film score and especially when when you actually need it, you know, um, movies like Scooby-Doo or Sonic the Hedgehog or big chunks of uh, Alita Battle Angel, big chunks of um, uh, Mortal Engines with Peter Jackson, um, the, the traditional sections uh, within Mad Max, it's so helpful that you, you know what an adagio is and how to write it and you know what harmonic rhythm is and how how a melody is supposed to be shaped or what harmony works really well with that um, with that mel melody. Um, and in the beginning, um, my music choices were always made by my ears and um, which is always a very good indica indicator because the way that our because I study for fun neurology and uh, part of neurology is like how the brain wants to perceive information. And the brain loves to perceive information that is logical. That's how the brain is built. Um, so if you are behind a piano and, you, and you, you press for 10 minutes random notes, your brain simply does not know what to make of it. And it will not be able to remember it. But if you play a bunch of notes in a succession that are logical, your brain will remember it. And there's stone cold proof in neurology why that is and i'm not going to go into that but um the read the, the, one of the things that back buck did and i see this uh, little comment music is math um buck actually quantified emotion through through um uh, mathematics and he basically quantified what emotion was and how to achieve it and then later um in the 20th century, um, and that's where we get to sound design, um, uh, composers started quantifying the harmonic series uh, because every note has endless harmonics uh, on top of it. There's only a few we actually hear, but even in the, in the, in the um, sub top level of frequency spectrum where harmonics interfere, they have an effect to uh, down on frequencies we do here. So it's a very complex matter. And these people have also analyzed why certain harmonic progressions sound so pleasing to the ear. And they developed a whole science for that. So very the same with sound design. Sound design can have such a complex series of harmonics. And some things will sound pleasant and otherwise the other ones do not. And that has a lot to do with how these overtones work in, in the top spectrum and how that reacts down in the frequencies that we hear. And obviously what we're now gonna add to sound design uh, to make um, um, it, it, it a, a piecing ple uh, piece of music. I do wanna say though that I'm extremely happy that um, now more and more composers start to get interested in sound design, uh, definitely propelled by the huge amount of uh, streaming shows on um, um, places like Netflix and, and, and Hulu, Amazon, um, and um, uh, it, there's a lot of composers being utilized uh, in, in, in the workforce that 
just do that. And I think it's, it, I think it's great. So some people have a lot of musical talent by just listening to things and they make always the right choices. A very good example is Aphex Twin for people that are potentially familiar with it, but he was a electronic artist uh, in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, he had a big song that was popular here that was called Window Liquor. And so the whole song is sound design, but it's so musically done. Um, but this guy has not studied music theory and he cannot play piano or any other instrument. Uh, so back to your question, through a little bit of explanation, you don't need to know a lot about music theory to compose great music, but that does mean that you're relying a lot on the talents of your ears, if your ears are well enough uh, and your brain well enough developed to shape something that will be perceived as logical by somebody else's brain. And the more alternative gets, lesser people will find that accessible. That's what's so great about Radiohead. They make such incredible awkward music if you want to listen, if you want to call it like that. But the way that they do it, it's so incredibly done that millions of people around the world love that band. And that is an art on its own. Um, but there's so many bands that also want to create something weird, but people listen to it and like, no, nah, that's not for me. And so in film music, there's a very sim similar thing going on. Um, and I think eventually, and Hans told me this once, uh, actually what really helps you uh, in, uh, in film scoring is knowing a lot about films, <laughs> you know? Um, so the discussion in film scoring is too much pointed to music the discussion should actually be more uh, about film and how what you design is going to help propel the story. Yeah, that's super interesting. I have, there's a few questions that have come in on software and hardware questions. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to your thoughts on hardware versus software, what you use, what you recommend for people kind of just starting into sound design world or um, anyone looking to further develop that, what do you recommend? I would say uh, stay as long as you can in the, in the software world uh, because it's cheaper. You have uh, total recall, uh, which means you can open up your session every day and it will sound exactly the same as it did uh, the day before. And software plugins also allow you to discover <clears throat> what type of hardware is out there and if you potentially would consider buying it. So I know a lot of people that are like, oh, I wish I had a Jupiter 8, or I wish I had a, a MOOC Model D from the 70s. Um, and those are amazing synthesizers, don't get me wrong. Um, but before you want to spend that much money on it, um, really experiment a lot with the software counterparts. I mean, Aturia does amazing modeling of uh, pretty much every analog synth out there. Um, Plugin Alliance just released uh, the Niphonium, uh, which is a copy of like a twenty, thirty thousand dollars synth that is made by hand. Um, and you know, playing with these uh, instruments give you a really good understanding. <clears throat> excuse me, um, what this instrument is capable of doing. And um, the same with Martellus Synthesis. There's a couple of subscriptions that you can take on various different. Um, sites and you have access to all these incredible Eurorack uh, modules. Aturia did also um, a, a MOOC System 55 um, that you can patch your own sounds. And if you, if you feel year after year that you constantly go back to that MOOC 55, then potentially think about it to buy the real thing because there is something very special about the real thing. And um, it's incredible what you can do with software and software is at least 50, 60% of what I do. And the other 40, 50%, um, oh, I see VCI Rack is free. Yes, it, it's free. But if you want a, a bunch of snazzy modules, you need to pay, I think, a little bit of a subscription fee is what, what I remember. Um, um, but what you can do in the real modular synthesis is goes far beyond. Uh, the plugins uh, versions. It's crazier because, you know, in the plugin world, we define, you know, resonance from zero to 127. Um, when you're at 127, that's it. In the analog world, 
it's basically voltage. And, uh, and you can keep adding more voltage to that input and crazier stuff starts happening. Eventually you will blow it up. But, uh, but before you blow it up, crazy shit is happening. And, uh, that, and especially when you build very complex uh, patches. Um, and the, um, the other beautiful thing of um, uh, hardware stuff is the, the accidental mistakes, uh, especially by patching something wrong. And that can happen, obviously, too, in the in the plugin world, where you patch something yourself. But the accidental mistakes are such a big part of how incredible sounds were created in history. You know, the examples are uh, too much of people. Oh, but I didn't mean to make this. I was doing this and this, and then, boop, that happens. Uh, so, um, so that happens a lot. It happens a lot with me too. And so. Um, I think where we are right now in the plugin world, it's so incredibly impressive what 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 you can do with uh, with plugins. And for me, the only reason why I'm working with hardware uh, is that uh, in the modular world, it gives me something a little bit more authentic uh, than in the plugin world. But um, other than that, it, I I really enjoy working with plugins. Uh, the only thing that I'm missing uh, is that if I'm working behind my computer with a mouse all day, I just really miss physical contact with an instrument because I call myself a full contact composer. Uh, I love to hold a guitar in my hand, uh, bang drums, um, and sometimes not even to use it in the piece of music that I'm making. But if I'm writing string adagios for five days, I'm, I'm ready to I don't know, like uh, take down a tree with an ax, you know, just I want I want to do something physical. And instead of behind, sitting behind a computer and just figuring out voicings and module information. And so the idea of playing with something that's hardware just really gives me a lot of joy. And so people that do want to explore the hardware world don't look for classic synths from the 70s and the 80s. They were cheap in the 80s, you know, uh, most of my collection uh, comes from that time period and, and I was working in the store and people traded this in to buy a new synthesizer like a D50 or uh, a, a DX7 Yamaha or the Cork M1 and literally my store owner, the, my boss, would pay 50 bucks for a memory moke and said, what am I supposed to do with this? And, and in 1983, four, you couldn't give away a memory moke for free. I'm telling you, it's really true. You could not give it away for free. And so I made a deal with my boss back then that I would buy all the stuff that would, tra would be traded in and I just stored it. And it was not that I had um, uh, the foresight that this would become hip again. That's not that. I just loved the machinery. I loved the engineering. I loved the quality of the sounds that came out. And I would think, you know, sooner or later, this is going to be useful to me. I don't know how, but it's going to be useful. And that's how I started collecting my synths. Um, and um, so the synths that I'm buying right now uh, come from the late 90s. And you can pick them up for absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Uh, sometimes as cheap as 50 bucks, 60 bucks. Um, but they're not necessarily that hip right now uh, or not always that useful. But who knows what's going to happen in the future? When I bought all that analog gear early 80s, I had no idea that this would become actually useful 20 years later when it's revived into, uh, into that. Then there, um, in the modular world, there's a, there's a lot of experimentation that you can do. You can start relatively cheap, uh, especially in the 5U world. Modules are, on average, a little cheaper than the, than the, the Eurorack. Eurorack has gotten quite expensive, I have to say. Um, but if you if you feel that is important to you, save some money up for that and then step by step, uh, try little things. Um, there's also small little synthesizers you can buy that are reissues uh, and filter, like the filter bank. Um, there is, um, Roland has these boutique series and I think they, I have them too. I think they sound really, really wonderful. And uh, so there's a lot of options out there that you can do um, that you can do on a budget if you really want to go down the road of hardware. But I would say 
um, if you do a synthesizer only score, then you would hear the difference immediately if you actually use the classic synths or you used all their um, uh, plug-in counterparts. But in the greatest scheme of things, where there's an action score, like for instance, Mad Max, you wouldn't hear the difference because there's like so much sound design going on, so many rhythms, so much distortion, so many orchestral stuff. And then a bass line somewhere in there, and the AB between the real mini mode D and the plug-in version, I would doubt people would hear the difference. And that's how you always need to look at things. It's like, is it worth the effort for what I'm personally doing? Um, I think it's more wise to invest in smaller plugin bundles or certain plugins that um, are really helping you to create sounds. And I pulled a couple up uh, and I just want to mention that. Um, so one bundle, which is again from French, France, What's up with these guys? Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's called the GRM bundle, GRM okay. bundle, and they make incredible plugins and so creative, and you can make incredible sounds with it. That's one. The other one is uh, Portal by Output, another incredible plugin where you can do really weird granulizing effects. You can create incredible sounds with it. It doesn't matter what you throw in: drums, vocals. Uh, a spinning cat, a barking dog, it doesn't matter. Everything that comes out on the other end is like, la la la, you know, it's fantastic. Everything that goes in. Um, the other one, I just pulled up too, but it's um, it's audio damage. Uh, they make incredible uh, plugins. I have two open here. One is the, the 914 filter, which is an emulation of the MOOC filter, but the MOOC filter is limited. Um, this one has a bandwidth filter. So you can go really small or you can go wide. I use it a lot uh, for strings and drum resamples. The other one is dub station. Incredible imitation of a, of a cheaper analog uh, dub delay. Crazy stuff you can do with it. Uh, the other bundle, and I have to mention this twice because it's Dutch. It's Dutch. That's okay. where I'm from. And there's a saying that says, if it ain't Dutch, it ain't much. So uh, this bundle, Fab Filter, Incredible company. Uh, they started as a synthesizer company way back in the day. Uh, and now they've been one of the mark leaders in, um, in creating plugins uh, for sound design purposes, but also proper mixing. Um, the other one is a Sound Toys uh, bundle. Uh, I, I have the decapitator up here, but uh, incredible bundle as well. Great for sound design purposes. Um, for mixing this all really, really properly, it's pr primarily I go to uh, my Waves plugins and the Plugin Alliance uh, plugins. Really, the combination of the two, you can, they're completely covered with how to mix things like really properly. I really love it. And I use uh, obviously Reactor a lot for, uh, for sound design and um, <clears throat> the Valhalla Reverb and the Black Hole. So uh, there's just a handful of plugins, but either one of these plugins, and some of them are cheap, some of them are a little bit more expensive, but you probably get way more mileage out of an investment there than spending that money on one hardware synthesizer that can only do one thing. So that would be uh, ultimately my advice. Cool. We have a few people asking um, for lists of these things that you're mentioning and the plugins and stuff. So if you don't mind, we'll get together. If everyone watching, we'll get together after and kind of type up a list and distribute that to everyone. Yeah, um, I have the I have, um, I have these uh, uh, plugins open. I can make a picture of it, and uh, I'll talk to Chem uh, after after yeah. our talk, and we'll create like a list and we'll post it on the very spot. Perfect. Yeah. So guys, yeah. we'll get you all of this listed out and links and all of that so you guys can yeah. reference it back. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about, so if for composers that are kind of new to sound design or getting into it or utilizing it more, um, what's your advice on when it's too much or when it's not enough and kind of how you got to that point in your life where, you know, as you're working on projects, you realize and hear and understand that you've reached um, max sound design for lack of better words and how do you kind of uh, encourage other composers to train their ear or you know work in it in a way that um 
is, you know, not too much or not too good. Yeah, but, the, the, the first thing I want to say at the beginning of this answer is whoever came up with the saying less is more is a total fucking idiot because more is more. Um, so that's the first thing. Okay. Uh, obviously, more is more is great but it needs to be organized you you cannot it, it cannot take over everything that you're doing my advice to people that are new to this is always uh three to four to five folds and i teach the same thing to my starting uh uh assistants first listen to sound design music i'm not talking about film scores listen to real sound design music like i mentioned afx twin uh, or John Hopkins, you know, just like great electronic artists that use sound design as their major inspiration to create music. First, listen to music. Listen to how it's being used by the real artist, not like some film score. I always say never listen to film scores, period. Listen to a film. A film score is a compromised version of real music living out there in the world. And I even say that about my own film scores. Enjoy them while you watch the movie, but all the music you listen to, Please listen to um, real music out there, made by real artists, by real classic composers, by real bands, uh, uh, you name it. So that's one, listen to sound design music. Then um, get your feet wet with, for instance, a plugin like Omnisphere, which has a lot of sound design instruments in there. Try to make music with existing sound design libraries. And, and, and then go back to listen to real music. It's like, how did you do that? One, two, three, four, how many layers am I actually listening to? And you start experimenting with existing libraries. And Omnisphere is a really great start for that. Omnisphere is also great to do incredible sound design yourself. Uh, um, and once you get comfortable making music with existing sound design, then the third step is, how do I make my own sound design? Because sound design means something that is designed. And what is designed is sound. But sound is always designed for a certain purpose. If you are the composer, you know better than anybody else what that purpose of sound needs to be. Therefore, ultimately, you need to design your own sound. In other words, every composer needs to be a sound designer to effectively use that in their music. Because what you don't want is playing a sound design sound from an existing library, and it forces you to write now music because the sound is forcing you to write that music. You want to create a piece of music in your mind that you want to create, and you need to design a sound that will fit your composition. So that's the four step program. First, listen to music that is sound design driven start recognizing sounds, start recognizing how layers are used. Is it more reverb in the back? Is it more in the front? How many different layers do I recognize? Second, get your feet wet with existing libraries, start making music with them. Be, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes, make as many mistakes as you want, because that's when you learn. Um, third, now start getting your feedback into designing your uh, your own uh, synthesizer sounds. Cool. So I want to switch gears just a little bit um, and talk a little bit about time management. Uh, how do you make time for sound design and avoid using exist existing presets during your creation process, especially when deadlines are tight? Yeah. So uh, I'll be I'll be very honest. It's like I do little or no sound design in the last four to 10 weeks of a project when everything comes to a close. There's simply no time. I, I can't, you know, my output sometimes needs, needs to be as much as six minutes of finished music in one day. So at that point, I don't have time to switch on my modular system or to open up reactor and start noodling with parameters. Absolutely not. So what I do is um, because I, I have so much fun in doing it, in when I have a downtime, which means when a movie is just over uh, and I have like, I don't know, six or 10 days before the other thing really starts ramping up, uh, I take those six to eight days to create as many sounds that I can 
uh, and I record everything into Cubase. That's another trick that I that I do. It's like when you play around with a plugin or you play around with a hardware synth, make sure that everything you do is recorded. Everything, because that's when you will record the happy mistakes. And the happy mistakes might give you sometimes more original sounds than the thing you're actually designing. Everybody knows that um, in a reverb plugin, when you go from one preset to another, you hear that <laughs> something really weird happens because all these parameters change at the same time. That's a happy accident I've used so many times. Um, and record everything in. And then at a certain point, you start chopping up all the sound design sounds you've created. You can create contact instruments out of them. That's what I did a lot. Uh, you can just store them as audio files. You name them, you group them by folders. And I have this weird thing that I still don't know, and I'm 52, I still don't know how to get a fucking microwave to work. I, every time I have to go online and figure out how the fuck that thing works. But I do remember nine years ago, in the first week of December, the sounds that I made on my marginless synth. And uh, I have this weird memory for all these little details, but uh, the birthday of my dad, I have to put that in my iCal, you know, and, and the alarm goes off. Uh, so just to make sure like, oh yeah, shit, not that I forget, but I mean like it, you know what I'm trying to say. It's like the, the daily stuff that most people would, rec would remember I remember all those files where they are. I can tell you exactly week from week what sounds I made. I know every demo I did for each version, what was different for the from the track before and the track after. And it sometimes drives my assistants nuts because I remember all that. And I'd say, hey, where's the trumpet? And they would say, there was no trumpet. I said, no, there was a trumpet. And then so we go six, seven versions back and boom, there's the trumpet. And so I have that weird memory for it but if you don't create a google doc and just like in the google doc just write down what you did that day in the sound design world and if you're looking for a particular sound look in your google doc and maybe you remember you go to that folder and you preview those sounds and you're like that's it that would be great to use even when you're on a deadline you want to build these little libraries of really really cool sounds but also there you can start simple start with omnisphere open up a preset, change a few parameters. It's like, oh, this is a little cooler. And then you save it as your own sound. And um, so start simple and then make it a little bit more complicated, but record everything in you do because the happy mistakes are usually the sounds you will uh, gear towards the most. <clears throat> How often do you go back on those happy mistakes and like re-listen to uh, those things that you've just recorded on for the sake of recording, so to speak. Well, I don't have a happy mistakes folder, if that's what you mean. I mean, ah, <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're all like, um, uh, you know, they all go by dates. And then within the dates, they're like categorized by certain types. Uh, sometimes I, uh, I have, uh, I do it myself or I have somebody say like, okay, uh, in last year there were like, uh, 31 days of sound design experiments. Let's combine them all into one master folder called 2019. And then we just sort them by um, by instrument groups like a bass pulse or screeching high sound or horror uh, high harmonics or, you know, I usually give it a name so it's easier, not only for me, but also for other people uh, to compile certain things because they're labels a certain way right instead, okay. of, of, instead of new sound one new sound two because you, you will drive yourself nuts new happy mistake one new I'm just exactly, exactly. <laughs> um okay so we have a few people asking so along with the the plugins list from you if you have any one um any artists or songs or places for people to look for uh, some of these sound design excellence in sound design that you reference for people to listen to and um study so to speak um well, this, this is the thing is that um i wish i could name you 10 artists out of the top of my head you but... you listen to your catalog uh, or my catalog yeah listen to your catalog 
no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, um, so what I'm trying to say is that I'm not sure how you guys out there consume music, but for me, um, I use uh, a lot of these online radio stations uh, of which I really admire what they're playing, uh, or I go uh, to these uh, Spotify playlists um, that uh, have like a certain theme or, and, and, and then it, go, it, it goes into a rabbit hole. It's, it's, it's like, oh, listeners also listen to this. Oh, you probably also like that. And then at the end of the night, I've listened to 50 or 80 things. And I don't know what these people are called. You know, I just remember enjoying my night. And uh, sometimes if it's exceptional, uh, I, I buy it. Um, but um, it, so, that, so that's the problem. But I, I, I can give you a good, uh, a good hint is that especially when you listen to certain type of electronic music uh, on, um, uh, on Spotify, it, it, will, it will take you to uh, another artist and another artist and another artist. And so there's so many uh, different types that you can listen to. So for instance, the, the, uh, the two artists that I mentioned earlier, so let's bring them back up again. Uh, John Hopkins is more current. Uh, whereas Aphex Twin is a little older, but Aphex Twin is way more experimental than John Hopkins. But if you start with either one of them uh, and, and then check the recommendations that come after that, you will go into a rabbit hole where sound design is becoming really, really important. And for people that are more looking into the ambient, uh, ambient type of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sound design and how it's being used in music, especially in the weekends uh, uh, for the people that have uh, Apple radio or iTunes radio, um, they have this station called Chill. And especially Friday night and Saturday night, the music is quite experimental, but it, it's really beautiful to listen to. It's very uh, soundscape-y uh, and very beautiful to listen to, the radio station, uh, Chill. And uh, so maybe you should use that as starting points and it will take you to so many different uh so many different levels um yeah cool so let's talk about we have about eight minutes left so i want to get into um you can go a little longer that's fine with me okay well yeah. we'll try to keep it tight but um your favorite project that you've worked on and how did you start writing for that project? If you can give us some insight into that, that would be wonderful. Which which products? Your fade, whatever your favorite project has been. Um, I mean, um, it's so hard because uh, every every project has uh, has this uh, very unique approach, and every project yeah. is like uh, so challenging. If, if if every movie was the same. It, it, it would be different. And the reason why I'm looking back so fondly on a movie like Mad Max is because there was only one. And the reason why I'm looking so fondly back on Deadpool because there was only one. And, yeah. and, the, and why I look back on things like Mortal Engines or Alida or Scooby-Doo because there was only one. Uh, if I had to hash out 10 Mad Max scores every, every year, I, you know, yeah, it would be different, but they're so special for, for me for many different reasons. But since we were talking about sound design, um, I would say, um, uh, especially on um, Mad Max, there was a ridiculous amount of sound design going on in that movie. And uh, where, uh, kind of what I said at the beginning of this talk, where every layer had a sound design version that was blending over into the next, into the next. And, and uh, that's one of the reasons why it took me 18 months, months to finish that score. It was a, a massive undertaking. How did you start writing that? How did you plan for the tone of that project for the Mad Max? Uh, well, the, when, I, when I went to Sydney, uh, and I saw a very uh, condensed version of the movie because there were big chunks of the movie were not shot yet. And, um, and so uh, the first scene that I saw was that crazy uh, guitar player in the front of a truck with, with the, the drums on the back. And so uh, talking to George, um, uh, he said, you know, obviously we need music for that and it needs to work with what these people are doing. And uh, so I had to figure out what the guitar player was playing and I needed to come up with something that would uh, look natural. 
Uh, and the same with the drums. So I was looking at what these guys were playing. So that was the first thing that I was working on. And then uh, I basically started there all the way to the end of the storm when, uh, when the first act comes to an end. And I finished that whole section. And that's the first thing that I showed to George as a proof of concept because Everything was basically in there, what I thought the score needed to be. And, uh, and it was quite uh, scary for me because he worked only with 100% orchestral uh, composers before and not the, the smallest ones, you know, uh, Jerry Goldsmith, uh, uh, John Williams, uh, Maurice Jarre. Uh, so it was a little scary, but when he heard what I did, he was so open-minded and he really embraced the whole concept of the, if you will, over-the-top rock opera with a lot of noise. And what about Scooby-Doo? How was that process for you? Scooby was incredible. Again, a director that was so open-minded. So the idea was, how do we infuse... Um, uh, different styles of urban music with 60s flower power with crazy sound design for the bad guy, almost like industrial 90s Nils uh, music to Tom and Jerry orchestral stuff. And so, you know, everything in one, in one score. Uh, so, but he was so open-minded and a big supporter and uh, it was really great to, to work on a movie like that. And so to be able to work on and Sonic the Hedgehog and Scooby-Doo in one year, um, so different than Deadpool or <laughs> Amir, right. uh, or Alita. So it was really great to work on these movies, really. Okay, let's get in maybe one or two more questions. I've seen this mentioned a couple times. So how do you orchestrate transitions, for example, between an intro and the main motive? Uh, orchestration is like a, it's like a, um, it's a, it's a difficult animal, and uh, I know we don't have that much uh, uh, time left. Uh, I would I would highly recommend um, because it's such a complex topic, and I can't really say that in two three minutes. Uh, otherwise, I would selling your question short. Um, go to my YouTube channel and go to season two or season three, and you will find individual episodes. Uh, of a longer scene with different themes in there and how they are orchestrated and how they play out through the music. I did um, a bunch on Mortal Engines and Alita in season three or four uh, that are really, really helpful, I, I think, because I really show how orchestration works, how a theme plays, how the counter theme plays, how they interact with each other. So I would highly recommend to see a couple of those videos. I think they will help you a lot. So it's the Alita Battle Angel themes and the Mortal Engine themes. But I think it's in season three or season four. Perfect. Okay, cool. Well, we are just about out of time. Um, there was a couple people that asked you this. Yeah, Tom's YouTube channel is, is 100%. They love your YouTube channel, um, they said. So this video will is being recorded and will be up on Tom's YouTube channel as well as ours. Um, so anyone can you know watch it back, play it back whenever. Um, any last words for any last, what is your biggest piece of of advice that you've ever heard or that you have relayed to people that you've been working with? Um, I think the, the, the most, since we're talking about sound design, I think the most, the most important part is um, create your own identity and whatever that identity is. Even when people say, dude, you're crazy. Why, why are you doing this? This is insane. Um, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, so, Try to create an identity for yourself um, that s sets you apart from, from what is the, the, the general uh, sound or the general approach to uh, composing. It's such an important thing. And, um, and be yourself in music is anyway very, very important because if you make something that you think is cool, just cool, how can you expect that somebody else gets goosebumps listening to it. You need to create something that gives you goosebumps. If you get goosebumps or if I write an emotional theme and I get actually really emotional when I listen to it, then maybe I have a chance that one other human being will feel that too. But if I write something and I think, well, 
okay, that, that's okay. How can I expect that somebody else actually starts crying, listening to it? Uh, very important. You need to feel moved by the music you're doing. You need to feel inspired by the sound design you're making. You need to feel uh, energized when you listen to your own music. Of course, you need to be very critical on your own work and you need to say, oh, I can do this better and better. Don't, don't settle for something too easy. Just always work, always work, always work. I have a note in my other studio that says, Tom, is this the best you can do today? And the answer is always no. That's awesome. Wow. Thank you very much. This has been super fantastic. Thank you for your time. Again, we super appreciate you and appreciate all of the wisdom that you shared with us today. And thank you again to all of our attendees. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Orchestral Tools is offering 20% off their entire library for everyone who joined in on this webinar today. So we will be emailing that out to you guys. So keep an eye on your inbox for that. Um, and also, again, if you found this webinar useful, please consider joining the Production Music Association. Um, we would love to have you as a member of our community. And again, the fee for composers is $99 annually. Um, and thank you again to our sponsors, the NMPA and APM Music. We will be back again in two weeks for another PMA Academy session and more info on that will be coming in the next week or so. Um, and that's it. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you, Morgan. Um, we will see you guys all in two weeks.